Hey, everyone, it's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, Pastor Brad Amara, my friend. How are you? You know, today it's raining and the sky is brown, and I blame Canada for that. It's brown. Oh, it's it's brown. No, it's not the right color. Even with the rain clouds, it's still kind of brown. All them forest fires. I don't know what Canadians do every spring, but it's becoming something of an annual tradition that they flood our skies with their burned trees. I don't even know how you do that from making maple syrup and playing hockey, but that's all I know. So <laughs> let's just go into asking you other questions about things I don't know. Um, so so I got one uh, from, a, from a youth pastor. I, I have a friend who doesn't know anything about religion. Do I start with the book of Genesis? How do I talk to them about this? That's a great question. So um, I think that this is where we get real simple. If you want people to know about true religion, right? You talk to them about Jesus and what he did. So it's real simple. You know your creeds, at least you should, if you're going to a Lutheran church. Hmm. That's the basic stuff you talk about. There's a God. He created us, created everything, in fact. And we have this problem called sin, and he sent his son into the world to suffer and to die so that sin, death, and the devil would be taken away, and that we'd be given forgiveness and life and salvation. Oh, and also we have this guy, the Holy Spirit, who comes to us, who gives us all the things that we need in this life, including creating, sustaining, and holding faithful the Christian church so that we can go about living our lives in the way that Jesus would have us do it. It was an astounding thing to me when I sort of realized that I memorized the Apostles' Creed not to sort of just avoid looking down during, you know, some church services, but actually because it it answers the question, who is God? And then you're Mm -hmm. not just like, "Uh, I guess uh, he, he, uh, Jesus, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ. We can actually go through this thing. Um, But is is Genesis even necessarily the right place to start? Like, is is the best place for for true witness to, I want to immediately pick a fight with you from an argument I don't really know a lot about, but let's let's go ahead and tackle evolution and there try to get to Jesus. Is this helpful? You know, this is one of those things that's uh, um, interesting to me. We had a guy at our church. Uh, in Bible study one time, we were talking about this exact issue. And this guy is, you know, 50 something, right? So he, he's not a spring chicken. He's not a kid anymore. And he, um, I, I raised the question, how do you talk to unbelievers? And this guy goes immediately for, well, we have to tell them that the Bible is the infallible word of God. And we have to prove the trustability of the scriptures before we can go anywhere else. And I said, really? Is that what makes faith? Is that what the Bible says makes faith? And he stops and thinks, and he goes, well, no, the Bible says that the gospel makes faith. I said, so maybe we should start with the gospel and Mm -hmm. then work around to filling in the gaps on the knowledge, right? Because this is the problem, right? We're all rationalists. We don't think we are, but we are. (laughs) And you can tell this in the way that we approach religion because it's not a proclamation of who Christ is and what he's done. Instead, we set it forth as a bunch of propositional truths that have to be taught, defended, and explained. Mm -hmm. And so because they're propositional truths, we correct, uh, excuse me, construct this whole system of how they fit together. And so we have to pick a starting point. So it's evolution. It's the authority of scripture. It's something like that. And then we build on that to eventually get to Jesus. And I guess, uh, I don't know, call me crazy, but this isn't what the apostles did in the New Testament. They just started with Jesus and then kind of went and filled in the other stuff along the way. And if you think about it, this is more or less what we do with our children. When we have a baby, we baptize them, we bring them to church, and they don't even start like formal instruction until they're, what, four, five, six years old, depending on the church. Mm -hmm. Then they get to go to Sunday school, and they don't really have the really intense stuff until they get to confirmation class, which at our church is still seventh and eighth grade. Yeah, that's that's a long time to send somebody out there with Alexa before we uh, maybe start to equip them to, to hear otherwise. That, that might be worth scratching at one day. But it, it's also just sort of a recognition of, of where you start. Uh, the, the first page of the book, it seems like an intuitive thing, but but why you need it might actually matter even more because like this isn't how anybody sort of uh, holds fast their religion. Like I, I came from outside of Christianity. I, I, I was raised um, in, in a secular side of Judaism. But when I sort of wanted to... to address all these things, mostly to prove religion wrong so I could keep doing dumb stuff. I, I, I did not think, like, could I maybe find a religion that would set me at odds with most of the scientific community? And, like, I would also like to be called uh, morally backwards by the majority of the, the society. And also, like, if there was a big boat, that would be cool. What what checks all those boxes? Christianity. Uh, well, and but, don't but, forget that, you know, Jesus teaches us through his apostles to basically work against every one of our fleshly desires and all the things that we want to do. He tells us, nah, don't do that. Huh. You know, that, so that's another one you want too, right? It it was definitely a, to to a, a young college aged male that was that was not a, an appeasing thing. What what got me though was um, Lutherans were the first ones to actually stand there and say, "No, you're right. Everything is awful here." Uh, we, we started with the the reality that that sin breaks stuff, and and then could there still be hope? And that that actually does look like Jesus. Well, and again, 
it all centers on Christ. And so um, it, I guess <laughs> the other thing that comes in this too is sometimes, despite the fact that we all profess to be monergists, right, and that uh, God does all the work in salvation, we act like synergists, like we have to cooperate. And the particular form I see Lutherans fall into this on mm. is not that I have to do something to save me, but I have to do something to save you. Right. And so, it'd be, you know, so your salvation depends on how good I am at articulating stuff, which is why notoriously Lutherans are very, very, very quiet about their faith. Because if I say it wrong, I mm. do it wrong. I don't know the answer to a question. Well, someone's going to, you know, fall away from the faith or never come to faith. And it's going to be all my fault. Well, perhaps, just perhaps, we trust the Lord when he tells us that his word is efficacious and living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and is able to do the things that he sends it to do, which means right. then that we have nothing to fear. Even if we don't, don't have the right words and we stumble a little bit, well, we still have Christ and we still have the Holy Spirit, and these will, in fact, do what God has set them to do, right? He will give us salvation just as he's promised. A hundred percent. And and that you're just exactly right. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. But somehow it has to be my reason and strength that, that saves you. That that's ridiculous. Uh but but in even to the, the core principle of it, if, if Jesus really is the good shepherd, does God want this person to be saved? Because I, I think sometimes we, we end up like, how do I sneak this person in the back door because God's not going to do it? And that's that's a pretty poor mindset to, uh, to, to, to begin witness with as well. It's an absolutely poor mindset. And I think this is... This is one of the problems we have culturally, you know, broader mm. than just us as in our little corner of the world, which is Lutheranism. We talk about evangelism, outreach, you know, mission work, whatever you want to call it, as a burden. You know, it's this this terrible burdensome thing that if we do it wrong, people are going to go to hell and it's going to be all our fault. And then we have this terrible burden. We have to go out and do all these things and say the right stuff and have the right tracks or else people are going to suffer and it's going to be my fault. Well, maybe instead we should see this as a joy. I've been saved in Christ Jesus. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned sinner, not with silver or gold, but with his holy and precious blood. And he shed that blood for you too. What a joy. What a wonderful thing. What greater thing in all the universe is there than this? Well, nothing. That's the answer. There's nothing greater than this. And so we start from that place. And so what if I you know, get inarticulate when I try to share this with somebody? or I stumble over my words a little bit, or when they ask me a hard question they don't know the answer to and I got to go ask my pastor. Well, okay, but isn't it just a wonderful thing? And if it's so wonderful, which it is, how can we not just tell people about it? And again, it is not a complicated thing. You just have to tell them about the Jesus who died for them. Yes, there's sin, but we have an answer and his name is Jesus Christ. Right. I think even the question that was asked sort of tackles it, that, that this isn't something that is yours as, as a burden, but but rather yours as a gift. You have a hope that there's actually somebody in your life, at least one person, they don't have that hope and, and you know what a comfort it is. You, you want them to have it. And so you start with that. If, if you stumble a little bit, there's also great resources. You have a pastor. Say, like, I, I might not actually know the answer to that, but I know a guy who does. Can I Can I get back to you? Like, you don't actually have to. To, to it, It's scary enough to have a basic social interaction. Trust me, I know. That's already <laughs> why I see witnessing as a burden, just because it's the same way as talking to somebody is to me. I don't want to make a phone call. I don't want to talk to somebody. I want to stay alone and, and be with me, even though I'm my worst enemy. But, but more than this, though, we, we're convinced that as soon as we open this door, it is our responsibility to know every single verse of the scriptures and be able to sort of recite them from memory as if that will somehow be the thing that does it. But like, if you can believe and you don't have all those things committed to memory, well, I'm not saying don't read more Bible, read more Bible, but also continue to go to the resources and, and maybe take your friend there too. Well, now I'm going to just make a plug here for the catechism. 90% mm -hmm. of what people will ask about is in the catechism because they're going to ask about, you know, did God make everything? Did he make sin? What's this Holy Spirit all about? Do, do we, why do we baptize babies? Why do you do that? What's the, what's the communion thing all about? Well, that's all in the catechism. Who's Jesus in the catechism, right? So the vast majority of it's in your catechism. If you know that, you'll be able to answer pretty much anything that gets thrown at you. And for that small minority of stuff that you don't know, your pastor loves answering theological questions, even better when they're ones he doesn't immediately know the answer to, and he's got to spend some time looking and trying to figure it out because uh, pastors get bored because we get asked the same things all the time. And if you find something really clever and neat and interesting and out of the ordinary, well, that gives us something to do besides the same old same old. And it's nice to have a little bit of spice in life, you know? 
Right. So I, I, I'm not saying I agree necessarily with the Gideons who like chop out of the Old Testament entirely out of the Bible. But at the same time, maybe the place to start to tackle the book of Genesis is from a, an understanding that Jesus rose from the dead. And he's the one who ascribes creation to, to being done in, in six natural days. So let's start with Jesus and then we'll work backwards to Genesis because Genesis is actually a whole lot cooler once you find Jesus inside it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think then to get at the other part of the question, that's I don't know if it was quite you know overtly articulated, but it's there. What part of the Bible do you start with? Mm -hmm. I'd start with one of the Gospels. Yeah. I really like, well, Mark is short. You know, they all have their own virtues. Mark is short. Luke's got a couple really great stories that aren't anywhere else. Matthew's very kind of Old Testament-y in some of the ways he puts things. John spends a lot of time, you know, explaining the things that Jesus does and says. So they all kind of have a different benefit to them, a little bit of a different take mm -hmm. on the same story. So pick one, even just pick your favorite one and sit down and read it with your friend after you've articulated to them who Jesus is. And then you can show them then this is why we believe this, because here we have this record of this guy. This shows it, and you can work from there. And another thing people too often um, do not utilize in this is just like bring your friend to your pastor. If you can convince them to come sit down and talk to your pastor, your pastor loves to have these kinds of conversations. And if you were to knock on your pastor's study and say, hey, pastor, my buddy over here, he wants some, to talk to you about some stuff, you know, with, with religion and whatnot, would you be okay with that? Your pastor is going to think that's just the greatest thing that happened all week. Pastors 100%. love doing that. And the the most intimidating time to do that would be on a Sunday morning. And that's also probably the, the, the worst time to do it. Like, also recognize, like, your pastor has 50 things going on on Sunday. It's not that he doesn't want to do this, but it, it's that just as much as your friend is intimidated about going to the worship service, your, your pastor is running around with 50 things. So do it on a Tuesday. And, and they recognize, like, we would love to have you on Sunday as well. But let's talk about it. And, and let's, let's anytime, anywhere. And by the way, if you're worried about, you know, stepping on your pastor's toes, pastors are easily bribed with coffee. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's low-hanging fruit. Some low-hanging fruit, right? <laughs> no, that that's that's fair. And, and I appreciate sort of the, the place to learn to start to talk about this. Um, is, is not sort of an uphill battle from creation, but but rather a, a, a down-from-heaven incarnate gift that is Christ Jesus for you for the forgiveness of sins. Well, and then this is the thing, right? So we do have a logical progression inside of the Christian faith, but it doesn't start with the proposition of six-day creation. It doesn't start with the proposition of the Bible is the infallible and inerrant word of God. It starts with Jesus Christ, the living Messiah, who has defeated death, destroyed the devil, and put sin to death in himself and given us life and salvation. That's where it starts. And when we start with that, then we logically build on that by looking at his words and teachings. And that's when we circle back around to things like, what is the Bible and how does that relate? What are the sacraments? How do they relate? Why do we do what we do on Sunday mornings? What's Genesis and creation all about? Who's Moses? Well, it all goes back to Jesus and we start with what he says and work out from there. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> Pastor, thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a good one.